All right, so in 2.5, we talked about all the algebraic properties, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, division, distributive, symmetric, transitive, reflexive. I got them all. Okay. And we started with this. These are like algebraic proofs is what they're called. But we said solve these equations and then give a reason for each step. So if I were to start with number one. Okay, when I rewrite that first step, what do I say is my reason? Good. So negative 5x plus 18 equals 3x minus 38, and my reason would be given. Okay, what could have been your next step? Because there's more than one. You could have, so would you add the 5x or add the 38? Add the 5x. So you'd get 18 equals 8x minus 38, which was the addition property of equality. But if I'm okay with addition, okay. Evan. Um, if there's like two, like in this case, you know what to do in separate steps? Yeah. Right. Good question. Yeah, even though they're the same reason, I would keep them in separate steps, okay? So now I would add that 38. So if you added 38... 56 would equal 8x. Again, it's addition. And then my last step would be x equals 7, and the reason was what? Good. <coughs> Questions on that one? Here, let's go. Fernando, sorry. If you move the 3x over to the negative 5x, can that also work? Absolutely. Yeah, there's more than one way to do this. So if you did that, it would have been subtraction, right? And then subtraction again for the 18, and then still division for that last step. Still work. So you can have more than one reason? Yeah. Because I, I, I thought it was like you can only have like one addition. Like nope. You can repeat. It could have been addition 17 times. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then number two, and again, we'll start by saying that this is given. So what did, what did, give me an example of something that you did first. Claudia. Distributed, okay, so negative 3x plus 15. Did you do it the same on the other side too? 2x. All right, Emily, you're on your own figuring out the end of that one. All right, so number three. <laughs> number three says if 3 equals 5 and 5 equals 8, then 3 equals 8. That property would be what? Transitive, good. Okay, and 4, if CD equals EF, then EF equals CD. Symmetric, good. Okay, so today we're going to learn kind of to put those things together to build. It's called a proof, okay? But it's the same thing. It's like one step and then what's the reason? One step and then the reason. Okay, so those are easy, right? Three and four are easy. Don't start to get scared when there's more than one in a row, okay? Before. Okay, so 30 said in the figure at the right, ZY equals XW. So ZY, this segment here, would equal XW, which is this segment here. And then it says that X, or sorry, ZX, from here to here, is 5X plus 17. And YW, from here to here, is 10 minus 2X. And then it says yx is 3. So I've basically taken two congruent segments and added the same thing to both sides, right? Does everybody see that? Like if I had actually written that out, zy was equal to xw, right? We said that from the beginning. And then we took each of these and added 3 into them. Do you see that? So if we added the same number to the both sides of the equation, are they still equal? Yeah, so I can just take this and set it equal to this. So I can take 5x plus 17 and set it equal to 10 minus 2x. And then I would add the 2x, subtract the 17, and I'd get x equals negative 1. But the question isn't what x is, it's what is zy. So if I were to look at zy which is here, zy is that 5x plus 17 without the 3, right? C 
So if I take the 5x plus 17 and subtract the 3 from it, I can take this and plug it in here, 5 times negative 1 plus 17, and then subtract the 3 from the end, and I get 9. So this little segment is 9, and because that little segment equals that little segment, I know that's also 9. So what will be really fun is that eventually you'll be doing that in a proof. Any other questions from the homework? Okay, so go ahead and open to section 2-6. So if you ask people about geometry honors, almost every single one of you will say that the thing they hated the most is proofs. And you're about to begin them, okay? You, you, my rule is you can't not try them, okay? The, they're not, some, for some people it just clicks and it makes sense. It's like a puzzle. It's like you know what you're looking at in the beginning, you know what you want to get to at the end, but you've got to figure out all the pieces in between how to get there, okay? And for some people, proofs are actually easy and it just makes sense. From the majority of people, they seem very scary at the beginning, okay? But I promise you that at some point, you are going to get a completed proof, and you're going to feel so accomplished, okay? And it might be this weekend, and it might be in October, but it will happen, okay? And you will not have that experience if you just give up. So my rule, even on homework, is even if you have no idea if you're doing the right thing, you have to at least try it out. Okay, because eventually you'll get there. So what we're going to do is these are called two-column proofs. And a two-column proof, and you did them with an algebraic function already. You wrote steps, and then next to those steps you wrote reasons. So by definition, a proof is a logical argument that shows the statement is true. There's various kinds, flowchart, paragraph, and two-column proof format, which is what we will most likely use on the left-hand side, you're going to put your statements, and on the right-hand side, you're going to put your reasons. And the statements would be given information or the result of applying a known property or fact, and the reasons are going to be explanations for each of the corresponding statements. Okay, these are acceptable reasons and proofs. So you can't write, like, because I think so, or because someone told me as a reason. What you can list is given information from a diagram, okay, or definitions, any of the definitions we've used up to this point, any of the properties you've used up to this point, any of the postulates, and any of the theorems. And theorems are previously proven ones, so something we've already talked about, not ones that you've read in a book. I don't know if any of you go home and read the book, chapters in advance. But you cannot use stuff from chapter 6 and chapter 2. You've got to pretend you don't know it. And here's the fun part about geometry, is it's cumulative. So when we start doing proofs in Chapter 5, you're going to be still using things like vertical angles and linear pair, okay? So the good thing is that it compiles, like you're going to learn it and use it and use it and use it, so hopefully it gets really ingrained in your brain, okay? The hard thing is that your book assumes that you're super, super smart with a great memory that remembers everything from Chapter 1 all the way on. So that's why I said that those definitions and stuff from Chapter 1 don't go away. You still need to know them. All right, so the properties of congruence. Now, these should look pretty similar to what we did yesterday, but who can tell me the difference between them? I'll be impressed if you figure it out, to be honest. But these say congruent instead of equal. Awesome. So these all say congruent instead of equal. Yesterday, we were talking about the actual length of a segment, okay? And now we're talking about the segment without any length involved. That's kind of the difference. To be honest, I am not going to nitpick between the, tif the, the two. If you want to show that an, a side equals a side, I don't care if you use equals or congruence, okay? It's still the reflexive property. If you show that, you know, the order switches, if DE equals FG, then FG equals G DE, that's the symmetric property. Whether you put symmetric property of equality or symmetric property of congruence, I don't care. And then same thing with transitive. So if AB equals CD and CD equals EF, then AB equals EF. 
That is the transitive property for congruent segments. And then all of these also apply to angles. All right, so this is what the baby stepping into two column proofs looks like. In this example, they're giving you the information at the top and they're giving you the statements and what it wants is the reason, okay? So let's look at it first. Before I even look at statements, usually I look at my diagram, I look at the given and I look at the proof and ask myself, does that even make sense? So this says write a two column proof for the situation in example four from the previous lesson. So in the previous lesson that we did, we had an example like this, and it said, given the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three, we didn't do this, this was in the book. The measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three. Prove that the measure of angle EBA equals the measure of angle DBC. All right, so before I even look at the statements, right, look up at, my gra up at the picture. So it's telling you that this one equals this one, and if that's the case, then EBA, which is this angle, should equal D, B, C, which is this angle. Does that make sense? Why? Because we know they're congruent and the one in the middle is the same length when you add it to either side. So you're going to be adding the same angle to both sides. Yep, if I add the same measurement to both sides, would that equality stay equal? Yeah, yeah. okay, so that's the first thing is good. It should make sense, right? This is a true statement. They're just telling you you have to show the steps to get there. So it's never going to be false unless it says what's wrong with this proof, okay? If it's just something like this, then it is true. You can assume it's true. You've just got to prove it. So now let's look at our steps, okay? The statement on the left, the first one says the measure of angle 1 equals the measure of angle 3. Where does that come from? It's given to you. So my reason is given, okay? You don't always have to start with a given but most of the time you do. Number two says angle EBA equals the measure of angle three plus the measure of angle two. What is that? Good, angle addition postulate. So when I say that an angle is the sum of its parts, it's angle addition postulate. The next one says EBA is equal to the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2. What just happened there? You substituted angle 1 in the place of angle 3. Number 4 says the measure of angle 1 equals the measure of angle DBC. 1 plus 2, sorry. 1 plus 2 equals the measure of angle DBC. Careful. Nope. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Angle addition postulate. So they tricked you because they put it on the other side, but it's the exact same thing. We said a big angle was the sum of its two parts. So I'm going to let you do AAP instead of doing angle addition postulate every time. And then this last one says angle EBA equals DBC. How did I get there? Good. So you said EBA equals 1 and 2, and then we said 1 and 2 equals DBC. So then we said EBA equals DBC, and this is substitution. Now this looks a lot like what? Looks a lot like a transitive property, right? If 1, then 2, and 2, then 3. The difference is it's not a single thing. We said that EBA equals the sum of something, and the sum of something equals DBC, and that's why we use substitution over transitive. If it had said angle EBA equals 1 and 1 equals DBC, so EBA equals DBC, that's transitive. So those are the two properties that sometimes get confused. Okay, so you just survived your first proof. Congratulations. Nobody died. Let's try another one. I'm going to give you a minute to try it. See how far you can get. All right, step one, AC equals AB plus AB. That's given. And that should say, no, 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 keep going with it. Okay, so then two, AB plus BC equals AC. Segment addition postulate. So I'll let you do SAP. So AAP, angle addition postulate, SAP, segment addition postulate. 
3. Substitution. Okay, we took the AC and what it equaled and we plugged it in the place of AC. And then how did we get from 3 to 4? Subtraction. So we took the AB away from both sides. Right, subtracted this and this, or the first one and that one, either way. So again, you always want to start out by like looking at your initial figure, right? It said that AC equals AB plus AB, so it would be a double of that AB length. And does AB equal BC? Well, from the picture, we know AB would equal AB. I mean, sorry, AC would be AB plus BC. So if those two are the same, then I can use the subtraction property to take it apart. Still good? Nope. Nope, still writing? Yeah. Okay. A, so a two-column proof just means statements and reasons. And these, the statements are given eventually, it's going to be empty. And you're coming up with your own statements and your own reasons. Like there's some in the homework. We're going to try one together, but yeah. So, and, and I don't want to hear the words like, I don't get proofs, okay, because you're going to start thinking it. So you just don't get them yet, which is okay. Some of you might. Some of you, it might totally click. But if you're feeling frustrated, okay, don't get it out of your head that you'll never get them. You will. Everybody always gets at least one. You just hope that that moment happens on the test. All right. One more. So they're getting a little bit longer in length. You could do it. All right, so we've got a couple of new steps in here. This one says M is the midpoint of AB, and you want to prove that AB is 2 times AM, and that AM is 1 half of AB. So again, look at your initial diagram. Does that make sense? If M is the midpoint of AB, does it make sense that AB would be 2 times AM? Yeah, yeah right? Because midpoint means what? Middle. The middle, right? So if I have two parts that are equal and I add them together, I'm going to get the whole thing, right? Or if I double one, I'm going to get the whole thing. So number one says M is the midpoint of AB. Where's that come from? That's the given. Number two says AM equals MB or is congruent to MB. So magic would be if it, you have to have two parts. And if like M, one, two, then two, one. Almost, that's like three. So how did I get from one to two? How do you know that AM equals MB? Mm -mm. And what's it mean if it's the midpoint? So if you didn't know the word midpoint, then you couldn't go further, right? Am I right? If that was some word, you had no idea what it was. But the fact that you know what a midpoint is leads you to that statement. You with me? So what you needed to know is the definition of the word midpoint. And a definition can be a reason. So you would just write definition of a midpoint. So knowing that a midpoint is the center of that segment tells you that those two are congruent parts. Does that make sense? Leah? Reflexive is anything equals itself. So if AM equals AM, that's reflexive. It has to be exact, it's exact self. Okay, so now from two to three, we lost the congruent symbol, okay? This step, and this is what I'm saying, if you were to plan this proof out on your own, you do not need this step. But if it's there for you, if you see it go from congruence to equal or equal to congruence, then the reason is definition of congruence, okay? That's all you need. So again, if we're writing this as, a, as an open-ended proof where the left side's not there, then you do not need that step. But if it's there, if you see it go from equal to congruence or congruence to equals, that's what it is. Now, 4 says AM plus MB equals AB. What is this? Segment addition postulate. The whole equals the sum of its two parts. AM plus AM equals AB. What just happened there? Substitute. You substituted it in. And 6 says 2AM equals AB. Combining like terms, and another word for that is? Simplifying. 
and then AM equals one half AB. So I, this is kind of a loose step. I'll either give you division or multiplication because it's kind of the same thing, right? You're either dividing by two, which is multiplying by the reciprocal. So either way. Technically, you're multiplying by the reciprocal, but I'll give you division. So they are going to increasingly get more complicated, okay? But even if you got one of, like, you better get a given. I'll tell you that right now. You got to get past the given, okay? There's no question marks with no work on this homework. But you could have probably, some of you could have gotten segment addition postulate, even if you couldn't have gotten the ones before it. So you've got to at least try. So this last, what we talked about before that I was saying, if you see it go from congruence to equals or equals to congruence, then the, the, the reason would be definition of congruence, okay? If you see it in your, in your proof, then you need that as your reason, but if it's not there, don't worry about it. That bell's about to ring, but I will work through, because there's open-ended ones where you've got to come up with the step and the reason. So I'll work through 24 on the video after you guys leave. Um, it's 24 is in your homework. So if you watch it, you can at least get one down. Okay, so this is 24. It says to uh, create a two-column proof given the information. So if you look at what's given to us here, it says the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equals 180 degrees. So these two together equal 180 degrees. And then it gives you that the measure of angle 1 is 62, and it wants you to prove that the measure of angle 2 is 118. So hopefully this does make sense. If I were to subtract that 62 from the 180, I would get the 118. Now our challenge is just to write it in steps. So if I were to start, I would start with my given that the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equals 180. And I can even add in there the measure of angle 1 equals 62. And that's given. And then I could have, so the other piece of information, this first one also could have been the linear pair postulate, or that the linear pair would add up to 180, which we'll get to in the next section. But for right now, we'll use that it's given to us. So then the second thing we can say is that the if measure of angle 1 is 62, I can say 62 plus the measure of angle 2 equals 180. And the reason there would be substitution. And then the last thing I would need to do is subtract that 62 from both sides, and I'd get the measure of angle 2 equals 118, and that's subtraction. So these are pretty basic. The ones that are in your homework tonight, at least, are, are pretty basic. They'll eventually get a little bit harder. But um, I'll, my only advice is to make sure you try as much as you can, at least state the obvious, the given and that kind of stuff, and see if you can work through them on your own. No question marks. Good luck.